Every story must eventually come to an end. Even ones that revolve around violent, never-ending rebirth. And no game series is immortal, not even Dark Souls. Meant to put the final nail into the series' coffin, Dark Souls 3 was the culmination of one of gaming's most prominent pedigrees. Built from the ground up for the most recent console hardware, Dark Souls 3 was an astonishing representation of the series' evolution that kept players on their toes till the very end. While From Software may be hard at work on their next highly anticipated mystery project, when it comes to Dark Souls, the final bonfire has been lit, and the final flames have burnt out, which means it's finally time to complete Dark Souls 3. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. This is the last day in our month of threequels, and we've saved the darkest one for last, Dark Souls 3. Now, since I've been completing Dark Souls, we've been fully stocked with Sunny D here in the office. Yo, that shit tastes like diabetes, though. It's not that bad. Yes. Right. The Dark Souls series has always possessed a sense of infamy, even if that infamy has, in recent years, eroded into an insipid, regurgitated reference that's lost almost all meaning. But even though calling Crash Remastered the Dark Souls of Platformers or the Cran Mac the Dark Souls of the Big Mac variants is severely off base, it does reveal some slight truth about the series' difficulty and how it's perceived by the general public. People think Dark Souls games are hard, many times even before laying their hands on them, which ends up drastically influencing their initial experiences when they finally do try the games. And by the time From Software began development on the franchise's third entry, they were well aware of this reality. In addition to officially closing out the series, Dark Souls 3 was also intended to be more approachable to new players. That's right, Dark Souls 3 was made easier on purpose. When it comes to design, there's a bit of the entire franchise's DNA within Dark Souls 3. The developers took what they learned from the first two entries, combined it with a smattering of influence from Bloodborne, and turned it all into the most aggressive and most approachable Dark Souls game in existence. Which, of course, pissed off half of the fan base and delighted the other half. You can't please everybody, especially Dark Souls fans. But a markedly more streamlined Dark Souls game is still Dark Souls through and through. It earned widespread critical praise, and at the time of release, it was Bandai Namco Entertainment America's fastest selling game of all time. Once again, everyone may not have been happy with it, but the vast majority of players saw it as a more than fitting end to the series that made so many people reevaluate if they were actually any good at video games. They weren't. While somewhat more lenient than its predecessors, Dark Souls 3 still has the potential to crack players cool in twain, which I witnessed firsthand when my colleague Alex played through the game on Super Beer Bros, our Let's Play channel. And I'm sitting here playing one hard game, <laughs> and all that happens is, oh, this dude sucks at this game! Oh, oh he sucks! I've been a trying oh, not God. to yell at him about how much he sucks! He made it all the way to the end, but not without leaving a bit of his sanity and dignity behind. And now that it's time for me to take my own journey through the kingdom of Lothric, I find myself seriously reconsidering what it means to complete one of these games. I was made painfully aware of how I failed to obtain two extremely obscure and difficult to obtain rings when I quote unquote completed Dark Souls 2. And I got my fair share of criticisms for not pronouncing the name of that game's world correctly. For the record, it's here it comes. Zhuang Lake. Thank you. Now, since then, I think I've come to realize and accept that everyone has their own personal completion criteria. And just like the Dark Souls franchise itself, I can't please everyone out there. No matter how much I collect, no matter how many new game pluses I finish, there will always be someone who's dissatisfied because I didn't do it the 
true right way. So I've decided on a set of completion criteria for my completion of Dark Souls 3 that's challenging, comprehensive, and fun enough for me. I'm not gonna be cutting any corners, but I'm not gonna shorten my lifespan for a couple of in-game items that I'll never even use. Here's the breakdown. To complete Dark Souls 3, I'll be resurrecting the Dragon Rider, my big ass buff boy with the health and strength to ungabunga his way to victory. Better yet, this will be his descendant, Dragon Rider the Third. Next, I will not be playing all the way up to New Game Plus 7. The game just doesn't have nearly enough reward to justify that madness. But I will be playing all the way through New Game Plus, New Game Plus 2, and New Game Plus 3 due to the four different endings in Dark Souls 3 and the trophies that are only obtainable during those higher difficulties. Alex's Super Beard Brothers playthrough on my profile already unlocked a good number of trophies, but in order to get the rest of these bastards, I'm gonna have to be meticulous about scouring through the game for collectibles and making sure to complete and ignore the appropriate side quests for each playthrough. Speaking of collecting, we're looking at nabbing every ring, every spell, and every gesture in the goddamn game. And even though I don't have to, I'm gonna shoot for collecting all of the boss items too, which means that I have to kill every single boss, including the optional ones, multiple times. I don't have to do it, but it just feels right. Personal completion criteria my prerogative, and that's just the tip of this masochistic iceberg. There's still plenty of other trophies, challenges, and the entirety of the DLC to deal with, which I've never even laid eyes on, unlike the rest of the game. And then there's these guys who have played the DLC and they keep making sounds like that, which doesn't exactly bolster my confidence here, but I refuse to get spooked. From what I've already experienced, Dark Souls 3 is beautiful and incredible and unforgiving. And I've already seen firsthand the worst that this game can throw at me. It's not gonna get any worse than the Nameless King fight. Ooh. Will you guys stop that? At the risk of sounding obnoxiously redundant, Dark Souls 3 is a difficult game. Even aside from its gameplay, its aesthetics, its setting, almost every aspect of its very design is crafted to make players feel uneasy and to make them question the things they might take for granted. So with Dark Souls 3, nothing is given for free and nothing should be taken at face value. Everything's a little richer and a little more complex and nuanced than what you might find elsewhere. The game's many locations are graphically gorgeous but are also undeniably decayed and desperate at the same time. The soundtrack has the ability to inspire awe with its composition, but players rarely get to hear it. And as fascinating as Dark Souls 3's story is, you've still gotta put in some work to understand it. This game isn't going to baby you with indulgent luxuries like a clear setting or character development. Players are yet again on their own to piece things together from cryptic lines of dialogue and random item descriptions. Thankfully, there's guys out there like Vati Vidya who take the obtuse mass of ideas that the Dark Soul games claim as their narrative and pare them down into well-produced, digestible goodies. Now, if you have not checked out his channel yet and you are a big Dark Souls fan, I highly recommend it. So, from what I understand, Dark Souls 3 takes place in the kingdom of Lothric, where everyone and their mother seems to be some sort of undead creature. The kingdom has seen better days as it's currently in the throes of the latest in a long line of potential apocalypses. Lothric's sacred first flame is once again in danger of going out, which will plunge the world into complete darkness. That is, unless a ritual known as the linking of the fire is completed. The problem is that Prince Lothric, the one who's supposed to be sacrificing his soul to link the fire so that humanity can go on existing, basically f***ed off like a teenager ditching fourth period. So, as a sort of cruel last-ditch effort, several of the previous lords, who successfully linked the flame, are resurrected in order to sacrifice themselves again. There's Aldridge, a heaving, cancerous mass of god-eating sorcery, Yorm, the giant with no face but a big machete, and the Abyss Watchers, the second coolest zombie gang of all time. First prize still goes to this one.
But of course, these revived Lords of Cinder also abandoned their duties, endangering all of existence with their negligence. Which brings us to the player character known as the Ashen One, who is Lothric's last, last, last resort. See, the Ashen One is an unkindled, someone who previously attempted to heroically link the first flame, but totally failed and died before they could. So in essence, we are playing as a loser, a bottom of the barrel Hail Mary, whose job now entails claiming the resistant Lord's souls, teaching Prince Lothric a lesson, and linking the first flame in order to redeem themselves and save all of humanity. All of this sounds dark and epic enough to be the basis of an 80s metal album cover, but no matter how awesome your story may be, people have to be able to actually experience it. To clarify, I was captivated by the narrative in Dark Souls 3, but that was despite the way it was presented, not because of it. I don't mind gleaning bits of Apocrypha off of in-game items and background details, but a balance needs to be struck between subtlety and clarity. I'm sure that there are plenty of players who experienced the full narrative their first time through the game by meticulously studying every collectible. But there are bound to be plenty of people who missed out on Dark Souls 3's fascinating premise because of how deep it's buried. And that's kind of a shame. Having a main character that's impossible to care about certainly lessens the game's potential impact on players, and having so many important story elements remain that far beneath the surface is sure to turn a lot of people off. However, upon accepting that Dark Souls will never deliver a traditional narrative, players are free to focus on the rest of the game's extraordinary aesthetics, even if they are all depressing as hell. The world and locations of Dark Souls 3 are hauntingly beautiful if you're into that sort of thing, and aside from everything that's trying to kill you, they're all virtually lifeless. Exploring kingdoms that have long since declined is nothing new for the series, but Dark Souls 3 takes this concept and puts it further under the microscope to a disturbing effect. Everything seems hopeless, nothing seems alive, and everywhere you turn, there are reminders of countless different civilizations that have risen and fallen, never knowing that they would one day be just another graveyard at the end of the world. Leave it to Dark Souls to remind me that Western civilizations could crumble at any given moment. Sharp-eyed fans of the first two Souls games can find plenty of references to those games as characters, events, and locations all throughout Dark Souls 3. And the locales that make their debut here have become some of my absolute favorites during my trip through Lothric. Hmm, let's see. Oh, there's Camp Crustacean, the Zombie Ghetto, a literal pile of shit, the Library of Undead Congress, Double Ghost Boulevard, and my favorite, the Bone Zone. The Bone Zone will full on eat your face. The worlds of Dark Souls have always implemented a strong sense of geographical consistency, and Dark Souls 3 is no exception. Players can often just take a look around to catch glimpses of locations you'll soon visit, or places that you've already been. But this effect has been cranked up to 11 this time around. You can often see completely different, impossibly contorted kingdoms from the one you're currently in. It's as if the world is on its last legs, the laws of time and space have clocked out, and what's left of reality is slowly folding in on itself. Congratulations, Dark Souls. You've officially conceived of the saddest and most disturbing apocalypse of all time. Plus, seeing whole cities twisted and deformed is enough to make me a little... It's just gross. Thumbs up. In many ways, Dark Souls 3 provides its players with the best of both worlds. There are scads of details and minutia for observant players, but that stuff never gets in the way of those that couldn't care less about it. But when you do take a closer look at these things, it's clear that Dark Souls 3 is as beautiful and impressive as it is tragic. And it is very, very tragic. What with the whole inescapable cycles of undeath motif? The same miserable events that just keep reverberating throughout time, going around and around and around and... Ugh. I need water.
When people get invested in something that's still a work in progress, it can be hard to satisfy them when the climax finally rolls around. But when it comes to Dark Souls 3, the guys at From Software managed to cut away a lot of the chaff and refine the wheat they already had into a closing chapter that exceeds expectations. In other words, this game is dope. If you've played any other game in the Soul series, then you already know the score. After crafting your hero, you take them on a sprawling action RPG adventure, exploring a festering realm, slaying enemies, and challenging the true hallmark of the Souls franchise, the bosses. Oh, and of course, you'll die. A lot. Like, double what you're thinking? Now quadruple that. That's about right. Souls still make the world go round in Dark Souls 3, and it still really hurts when you die right before reclaiming them. <sighs> but that risk-reward system is still one of the purest examples of how Dark Souls expertly and exceptionally challenges its players. The level design may be a bit more linear this time around, but the sheer detail of every area and the game's pacing through them are unparalleled, and there are still plenty of optional bosses to mercilessly kill you and plenty of hidden areas in which to wander off and die. Players are still free to create whatever kind of undead protagonist they want, from sorcerers to archers to big-ass walking tanks of meat and anger. But no matter how you build your character, players are subject to Dark Souls 3's faster action and greater focus on offense. The maneuverability has been turned up, leading to gameplay that's far less reliant on turtling behind shields. It's nowhere near as erratic as Bloodborne, but it still finds a new happy medium between aggression and defense. Oh, you can't run for Forever. Those days are over. Rush down is the new meta. Ah, hold this in your chest. Okay, good game. In all honesty, the developers could have made poor decision after poor decision with this game, and I'd still adore it, as long as it remained as unflinchingly challenging as its predecessors. I'm not lauding difficulty for difficulty's sake. I'm just glad to see that Dark Souls 3 carries on the tradition of not holding players' as hands. Just like how you don't always progress in Dark Souls by traveling far, but rather by opening up shortcuts, this series has always encouraged players to discover and cultivate the abilities that they've always had close at hand. I said it before and I'll say it again. Dark Souls is the tough but fair stepdad that we all need. And this dad's got a few new tricks up his sleeves too. Most notably, focus points. That blue bar under your health meter isn't just for dirty magic users anymore. It also now governs the weapon arts of your various tools of combat. Now, just about every weapon has some sort of special ability, drastically increasing the game's playstyle variety. The entire undead system also has been overhauled since Dark Dark Souls 2. Your maximum health no longer slowly declines every time you die. Instead, you have your base health, and when you use an item called an Ember, you get a 30% health buff and access to the game's deeper online features. You remember online Dark Souls, right? That's the place where you're more than welcome to accept help from friends and anonymous allies, but in exchange, you leave yourself open to invasions from people who think you're dumb enough to follow them into a swarm of enemies. Oh, come on, man! You're just wasting everyone's time. Okay, let's move on. Dark Souls 3 contains some of the series' most fascinating foes, from the imposing to the nauseating, but the bosses continue to be the real stars of the show. Just when you think you've figured out their intimidating, titanic tactics, they will reveal their final forms, which are specifically designed to push your sh in. The game features a number of bosses that are truly inspired, representing the developer's willingness to experiment as well as their mastery of what makes a boss fight compelling. And to showcase a few of these big baddies, I present to you Gerard's Top 3 Dark Souls 3 Bosses. Starting with number 3, the Deacons of the Deep. To provide a little context here, players will at some point be tasked with busting their way into a huge dark cathedral. After fighting past hordes of zombies, players will find the interior eerily empty. But upon penetrating just a little further into the church, players will find themselves in a giant mausoleum surrounded by the Deacons of the Deep, a gang of undead clerics and bishops who've all got their eyes on you. Admittedly, this fight is a cakewalk, but it's noteworthy in that you have to take on an entire congregation congregation at once. It's incredibly creepy to wonder why the cathedral is so vacant, only to then run into the wrong neighborhood. And it's incredibly satisfying to take several of them down in one swing. The deacons may not be challenging, but they're unforgettable. Number two, 
Half Light, Spear of the Church. You'll actually only fight this guy if you attempt this boss fight while in offline mode, in which case, he's nothing to write home about. But things get really interesting though, if you remain online. Instead of a traditional boss, or automatically summoned NPC, the boss becomes an actual live online player. Players who join up with a specific covenant have a chance to be summoned as an actual Dark Souls boss, letting players serve as other players' gatekeepers. It's kind of ingenious in its simplicity, and there's really no other fight quite like it in this series. Thumbs up for innovation. And number one, the Twin Princes. It turns out that the truant Prince Lothric doesn't fight his own battles. Instead, he sends his mute, handicapped big brother after you. But don't feel too bad for Lorien. He's got a flaming, demon-slaying sword and can teleport at will. What makes this fight so excellent is its second phase, which is triggered upon depleting Lorien's health bar. Prince Lothric will resurrect his brother and jump on his back, Yoda-style, ready to deliver a fraternal beatdown. Now, you've got a great sword-wielding giant bamfing all over the place, while his brother tosses hexes your way. Plus, if you happen to take out Lorien before you finish off Lothric, he'll revive his big brother yet again until you manage to take out Lothric first. It's incredible how much the princess character comes across in the middle of this fight. The details of their relationship are conveyed succinctly and powerfully. And of course, the boss fight itself is fantastic. At least, it is when you're not getting cleaved to death. But those three are aren't even close to the toughest bosses in Dark Souls 3. Oh no, that honor goes to Gerard's top three most bullsh** bosses in Dark Souls 3. Number three, the Nameless King. Now this guy lives in infamy and has undoubtedly made many people sh** lists, and for good reason. His pet dragon spends plenty of time airborne, padding the fight out with plenty of wait for your turn time. And his second phase is one of the most brutal skill checks in the game. His range is deceptive and he leaves very few gaps in his attack strings. Beating him down comes to swallowing your pride, waiting for openings, taking careful single swings and getting the hell out of there while you still can. The Nameless King isn't unreasonably hard, but he might just be the walking personification of get good. And if you're not ready for him, he'll walk away with hours of your time. Ugh, what a tool. Number two, Dark Eater Meteor. This giant dragon simply has too much goddamn health. He's got moments of vulnerability, but when you finally do hit him, it only takes off a sliver of his health bar. It's almost like you just attacked your own morale. Meteor fights an aggravating war of attrition with periods of virtual invulnerability and attack sequences that will go on way too long. You're bound to mess up while fighting him, and when you do, he'll do far more damage to you in one hit than you could ever do to him. Be sure to carbo load this one because this fight is a marathon unless you summon a naked dragon hunter to help you out just look at the damage from this guy and my number one sister frida at first everything seems on the up and up with this fight she's just your average stealthy scythe wielding ice nun but once you take her down she just has to drag her crazy chair bound daddy into things the contrast between their designs and fighting styles is wonderful but every time you focus on one of them the other is bound to ruin your day from behind you can attempt to focus on sister frida but big daddy won't be far behind slapping his bowl across your head. You can try to aggro him, but it won't be long before a trail of ice appears beneath you. This beautiful ballet between the two of them would be impressive if it weren't so frustrating. And when you do finally take them both down, the real hell begins. Sister Frida transforms into a full-on Grim Reaper with huge dark flame attacks. Her stealth mode is even more effective, and she does but loads of damage. This entire fight is grueling thanks to its multiple phases and because it's utterly punishing. That being said, now that I look back on it, I have to admit, it's probably one of the best fights in the whole game. That same feeling is reflected throughout the entire game. Completing Dark Souls 3 felt daunting and stressful in the moment, but once I finished one task, moved on to the next one, and looked back on what I've accomplished, I would often realize what a good time I've been having all along. For instance, combing through every corner of Lothric for the first time was exhausting. I made sure to search every corner, pick up every item, and solo every boss. No help. I'm a big boy and I can do it all by myself. But putting in that effort ultimately paid off. Exploring every location led me to the coolest secrets in the game. 
picking everything up put me much closer to knocking out some collectible center trophies. And beating every boss by myself proved that I can take on any challenge that Dark Souls 3 could conjure up. Unfortunately, some sets of collectibles are only completable after going through convoluted side quests and hours of hardcore grinding. Yes, you can acquire most of the spells, rings, and jesters in the game simply by being thorough, but a lot of them are locked behind subsequent New Game Plus playthroughs. Certain rings just show up in New Game Plus and New Game Plus 2 in spots that there were no rings before. And since each boss has at least two items tied to their tradable souls, that means that I had to defeat them all again during New Game Plus, even the ones that are technically optional. But at that point, I had already proven that I could solo them. So New Game Plus was all about that co-op life, baby. Oh, and of course the Nameless King is the only one with three boss items, meaning I had to kill him three times because he just had to be that guy. No one cares about you or your stupid ass hat, Nameless King. Go home! While satisfying the conditions for the four different endings was simple enough, playing through Dark Souls 3 four whole times took a lot of time and dumb luck. But thankfully, with each trip through New Game Plus, my mistakes grew smaller in number and the combat grew less and less intimidating due to none of the enemies being able to keep up with the rate of my buff boy gains. I came, I saw, and I tanked. Hold that, brother, hold it. It doesn't matter how big I got. Nothing could have prepared me for dealing with Dark Souls 3's covenants. Just as in previous titles, players can join up with in-game gangs known as covenants, making them eligible for certain online events. Some covenants automatically summon you to defend areas from online players, while others will spirit you away to come to the rescue of other players who are being invaded. And still, other covenants revolve around being a good guy and helping people with tough bosses. No matter which one you join up with, you'll earn a covenant specific item upon completion of your duties. No, there are no trophies for collecting these things, but if you turn them in, you'll increase your covenant reputation, which levels up your covenant rank, which can reward you with a spell or a ring, which there are trophies for. And now you know why I had to join so many gangs. Doing some online stuff and unlocking some trophies for your troubles sounds simple enough, but it's actually a perfect storm of crap. Getting summoned to fulfill your duty can take forever. Sometimes I'd get summoned every few minutes. Other times I'd be alone for hours. Sure, you can technically get all the Covenant items by random drops, but with the drop rate being so low, even with all the discovery rate boosting gear, you're still looking at hours and hours and hours of mindless grinding. This right here is the point where Dark Souls 3 shits the bed. To maximize my chances of getting an item, I ran laps through areas with the appropriate enemies, hoping that the game would magically pair me up with someone. Sometimes I'd get lucky and someone would summon me via my soapstone symbol. Other times I took fate into my own hands by becoming a scumbag invader boy. But no matter what, there was always grinding forever with the grinding. All it would have taken to improve the situation is one small change. Make the summon rate much faster or or make the drop rate a little bit better, or at least don't have the covenants required 30 of their items to get the item you need. Some only require 10, which is a perfectly sane number, but 30 is goddamn ridiculous. Who the hell gave the green light to 30? At the end of hours worth of farming and praying, all the covenants were satisfied, the final items were earned, the last trophies were unlocked, and Dark Souls 3 was finally completed. But I'll never be the same. No knowing that there's a force out there that simply can't be buffed through. God damn you, Dark Souls! Dark Souls 3 proudly continues the tradition of not giving players a damn thing for completing it. That is, aside from an excellent adventure, and a sense of accomplishment, and tons of replayability, and your college tuition, 
Okay, not that last one, but Dark Souls 3 truly brings so much to the table that I honestly don't mind the lack of literal rewards. Now, this was far from my first rodeo with the series, so I was ready for this game to inevitably break me and reshape me into a stronger player. It's certainly tough, but witnessing yourself get better and better makes every moment worth it. Yes, even that senseless grinding. That illustrious platinum trophy and the knowledge that I earned it is more than enough of a reward. While I completed Dark Souls 3, there were 71 deaths, 4 campaign playthroughs, 47 boss souls claimed, 33 gestures, 96 spells, and 107 rings collected, 66 hours of total playtime, and zero adventures left for the Dragon Rider. Damn, now that it's all over, the whole thing feels kind of bittersweet. From the very beginning, the Dark Souls series has seemed daunting for many players, and downright nightmarish for completionists. But in reality, these games have been some of the most refreshing, elegant, and worthwhile games in recent times. Completing Dark Souls 3 may require just a bit too much of players, what with the delving into the abyss of the grind. But as the final flame burns out, no one can question the impact that this game and this series have had on players far and wide. You know, it's funny, I never thought that I would be so bummed to see a franchise that gave me so much trouble go away. But now that I'm done with Dark Souls 3, I can confidently say that it definitely lived up to all of my expectations. Except for all of that lame ass grinding towards the end. Pour a sunny D out, y'all. Cause with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like what you saw today, hit that subscribe button. We do videos every Tuesday and Friday. And if you want some more Dogger Souls 3 goodness, we did a Let's Play of it over at Super Beer Bros. You can click or tap that playlist right here on screen. Guys, I've been The Completionist, and I'll see you next week for another brand new episode. Bye.